Tonight, we have ecologist Dave Peters speaking on the white oak of the Northwest, the story of an arboreal shapeshifter. Now, since this program will be recorded, if you wish to remain anonymous, you might avoid using the chat or the Q&A because they show your name. We welcome you to this special program for Native Plant Appreciation Month. The Washington Native Plant Society is hosting a variety of activities to celebrate native plants. There are webinars, classes, plant sales, field trips, and volunteer activities. To learn more, please go to the website wnps.org. The mission of the Washington Native Plant Society is to promote the appreciation and conservation of Washington's native plants and their habitats through study, education, and advocacy. If you're already a member, we thank you. Membership supports native plant conservation and education, and it connects you with native plant enthusiasts in your neighborhood and across the state. To join as a member and learn more about our work, please go to wmps.org. It is with respect and gratitude that we strive to improve relationships and join native cultures in stewardship for this land and the native flora of Washington. I am speaking from the homelands of the Suquamish, Coast Salish peoples, the original and continuing stewards of the coastlines and forests of the Salish Sea. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to wait until the end to ask your questions. And uh, we will also have the opportunity to raise your hand and ask questions orally at the very end. Please use the chat for your comments and resources. And thank you. And please join me in welcoming Dave Peter. Oh, well, let me read his bio first. I'm sorry, I'm a little um, rusty at doing this. So I, if we were in person, we're welcoming you, Dave. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> Dave has studied Northwest vegetation and ecosystems for over 30 years, mostly as an ecologist for the US Forest Service. His fascination with how and why vegetation developed into the configurations and combinations that we see at this moment in time led him to question the very concept of what is natural and what is not. Tonight, we will enter that rabbit hole to consider one of the most unnatural of all natural places and its charismatic keystone species, Gary Oak. And with that, we'll turn it over to Dave. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Julie. Um... Let me get the screen shared here and um, yeah, okay. So, okay, so tonight I'm uh, a privilege to talk to all you folks. Um, I'm gonna be talking about White Oak of the Northwest, the story of an arboreal shapeshifter. And of course, um, we're talking about um, Gary Oak, and I seem to have a issue right off the bat here. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, uh, this is going to be a little interesting. Uh, it's not advancing the way I had expected it to, but I got to work around here. Okay, so I think we're we're rolling now. So, um, so yeah, we're talking about Gary Oak, Quercus Gariana. Now, if you uh, read descriptions of this uh, tree in a book, you'll probably find something like deciduous tree, 50 to 65 feet tall with solitary or multiple trunks or a shrub. Well, that just about covers all woody vegetation, doesn't it? I'll also say something to the effect of that the tree is, um, when it's mature, is open and open grown, has a broad rounded crown. But of course, we're not always seeing them when they're mature and uh, open grown. And even the broad rounded crowns can come in different shapes and sizes. Um, 
A lot of times we're going to see them in a crowded forest type situation, in which case they're going to have this kind of a narrow base shaped crown. Gary oak is not shade tolerant, so all of its lower limbs are going to be shaded out. They'll die, fall off, and you'll be left with nothing but the skyward pointed limbs and a little cap of foliage up on top. Now, another form that it commonly takes is this. Well, now we're changing. Let me see. There we go, this one. And um, this is what I call the columnar shape. This is the um, shape of a young, open grown tree, a vigorously growing tree, or the almost the exact opposite, a struggling tree in a canopy gap. Now, if it's a young tree, they grow skyward as fast as they can first, and only later do they spread out and get that rounded uh, crown. But when they're growing in a narrow canopy gap inside of a denser forest, they're aimed at the little hole of light at the top, and they also adopt this columnar shape. In that case, this is a marked tree. It's probably going to die. They don't often grow out of those canopy gaps. So uh, Gary Oak covers a lot of ground from the uh, uh, Vancouver Island down almost to Los Angeles. Now, north of Eugene, Oregon, it is the only native species of oak that we have. Now, you can find other species of oak that have been brought in from around the world, but that's the only native one. As you get south of Eugene, then you start picking up some other oaks. In Southern Oregon, you'll start picking up California black oak and Canyon live oak. By the time you get down into California, now Gary Oak has a lot of company because there's about 20 species of oak in California. So obviously covering this much ground north-south, it's gonna experience a lot of different climates from really hot, dry down here by Los Angeles up to Vancouver Island where it still has the dry summer, but overall it's much cooler and much wetter. So it also is gonna span a lot of soils. Gary Oak really isn't too particular about the soil in a particular situation. Uh, so it can grow on almost any kind of a soil. The one thing I want you to really keep in mind is this one right here, it does not tolerate shade. Um, and that means that wherever it, it grows amongst conifers, which can almost universally grow taller than it, um, it's going to be outcompeted unless, and we'll talk a lot about this as we go along, unless there's something keeping the conifers away from it. Okay, so there's a lot of different names that this tree has gone by over the years. Um, Gary Oak, of course, that's what we're talking about tonight. I was asked to do a talk on Gary Oak, so Gary Oak it is. <laughs> Oregon White Oak is in very common usage as well. They're one and the same. Oregon White Oak is what is accepted by the USDA. And if you look it up on the National Plants Database, that's the name that it will say is the preferred name. Um, personally, I actually prefer Oregon white oak simply because I have kind of a philosophical problem with calling any plant or animal after a person. But be that as it may, tonight it's Gary Oak. Now we've got a bunch of other names here which are all pretty much archaic. Uh, if you delve back into the literature at one time or another, you'll find these different names being used, but they pretty much are out of usage now. And also we have a lot of Native American names and there's a reason for that. Um, this was a very important tree to uh, native peoples. The acorns, for one thing, were an extremely important food crop. And so you can bet that every tribal group from Vancouver down to California had their own name for Gary Oak. So we could make this list really long. Now I'm gonna put up my laser pointer here. There we go. That'll be a little easier to work with. So meet Nicholas Gary, the namesake for this tree. So how did his name get attached to Gary Oak? Well, Nicholas Gary was a deputy governor of the Hudson's Bay Company. In 1821, Hudson's Bay Company decided to merge with the Northwest 
company. Both of these are, of course, fur trapping companies at the time. And they thought a merger would go well because um, they were facing increased competition from uh, companies in the United States that were beginning to come up and challenge them. So they thought a merger would be a good idea. So of course that was done in the corporate offices in London, but once having merged, then they had to explain this to the fur trappers uh, out in the back country. Well, these people had been intense competitors for a long time. There were a lot of animosities built up. They would regularly run each other out of their trapping areas. And so they needed to have somebody go out and tell them that they were all gonna have to make nice to each other now. Uh, so as it turns out, Nicholas Gary, being the only unmarried member of the committee, volunteered, perhaps under pressure, for this mission of adjustment and conciliation. So he and a fellow from the Northwest Company set out for the hinterlands, which back then was Fort William at Thunder Bay, Ontario. They went to a few other places too to talk to the trappers. But by all accounts, Nicholas Gary did a fantastic job. He was patient, he was articulate, the trappers liked him. And so he was able to explain the case for the merger. They were okay with it. And he came back something of a hero in the uh, Hudson's Bay Company. Well, he never came within 1,500 miles of a Gary Oak though. He never saw one. He probably never knew about them in his life. So how does his, his name get attached to it? Well, that was the doing of Scottish botanist David Douglas, who, as it turns out, was a good friend of Nicholas Gary. And so he honored him by naming the tree after him. But I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. So Douglas was actually sent by the Royal Horticultural Society of London to North America three times to collect plants, send them back, and study the North American plants and describe them, and in some cases, name them. Uh, on his second trip, he came to the Pacific Northwest. That lasted for three years, 1824 to 1827. And his base of operations was none other than Hudson's Bay Company, Fort Vancouver. Well, the folks at Fort Vancouver were extremely good to him. They helped him get around. They helped him find things. They fed him. They took really good care of him. And I think he felt really indebted to them. And so it was a very great convenience that he just happened to have a friend who was a rising star in the company. And so he could actually honor both the company and his friend at the same time. Well, so he put the name of Perkis Gariana down on paper, sent it back uh, to the Royal Horticultural Society. And, um, and then on his third trip out, uh, he came back to Fort Vancouver. And then on his way home, they stopped off at Hawaii. Well, he got delayed there for a while. So what does a botanist do when they're delayed? He went botanizing. And while botanizing in Hawaii, he unfortunately met his, uh, met his death. Uh, Hawaiians had been in the habit of digging uh, pit traps to trap wild cattle. Cattle had been introduced and gone wild out there. And this is one way you could catch them and get something to eat. Uh, but unfortunately, he fell into a cattle pit trap that was occupied. And so he was mauled to death. And so he never actually lived to see that his choice of name uh, officially recognized. But that task then fell to his mentor, William Hooker, who was also in the Royal Horticultural Society. And in 1838, uh, William Hooker got the name applied. And that is why both of their names are attached to Orcus Gariana uh, as the official name. But as it turns out, Douglas wasn't the first of the European botanists to come across Gary Oak. That fell to Archibald Menzies, who was on the Vancouver expedition. And in 1792, they were camped out in Northern Puget Sound. And while strolling down the beach one evening, Menzies came across an oak tree. And so he actually made the first drawings, sketches, um, descriptions, of, uh, of what we now call Gary Oak, but he didn't carry it much farther than that, so he wasn't the one that actually uh, got a chance to name it. So oaks are in the family Fagaceae, that's the beach family, along with chestnuts and of course, beaches. 
A couple of other things in that family that you might be familiar with because they're Northwest species are the golden chinkapin and the tanook, but neither one of these are in the genus Quercus. So neither one of these are, are true oaks. Now oaks are an incredibly um, widespread and diverse genus. They have a worldwide distribution. Um, tonight, we're only going to be concerned with the subgenus Quercus and the section Quercus because those are the white oaks. But a little bit of background here. The oaks, all oaks, evolved way up here in northern Canada. That is their natal grounds up in what's now tundra and boreal forest. Now, at the time, of course, this was the early Eocene, 56 million years ago, Earth was undergoing a severe uh, bout of global warming, and the climate was about 14 degrees Fahrenheit or 8C warmer than it is now. We had forests pole to pole. Throughout the United States, for example, it was tropical vegetation. So when you got that far north into Canada, we had temperate deciduous forests, very similar to what we now have in the Eastern United States. In other words, the climate was warm in the summer and wet, kind of a monsoonal type climate. And this is the climate which oaks evolved in. So they would have cool winters, but warm, moist summers. And keep that in mind, because as we go on with our story tonight, that's going to be important. Almost as soon as they evolved up there, they crossed over the North, North Atlantic land bridge into the Finno-Scandinavian area and made themselves comfortable up there. But as the Eocene went along, it began to cool and dry, and they started heading south along with that cooler climate. So when they got down into Europe, they pretty much occupied all of Europe, and then they blitzed on across Asia and settled into the montane areas of Southeast Asia. And this has become one of the most diverse areas for oaks in the world. Um, almost all of them being evergreen species. Now, they also came down into North America and down into Mexico and Central America, again, in montane, subtropical and tropical environments. And this is perhaps the most diverse area for oaks in the world. So these two areas, Mexico and Southeast Asia, have the most diversity of anywhere. There's quite a lot of diversity in the, in the Eastern part of the United States, that was an easy transition for them just to slide right down with the climate into the eastern part of the continent. But coming down the Cordillera and off into the western United States was a difficult transition because remember, this was a warm and wet summer climate. Now they were moving off into a warm and dry summer climate. So this was going to take some serious evolution to make that happen. Um, this is probably why the diversity is lower on the West Coast. And also the same thing happened here in the Mediterranean regions of Europe and North Africa, somewhat lower diversity in there for the same reason. Um, the, it's, it's a much more difficult habitat for this taxa to adapt to. Okay, so here is a, a phylogenetic tree of the oaks. And you can imagine that right in there was a point up there in Canada where they evolved. Uh, and if you do that, then time marches out from the center of that in concentric circles. And so quite early on in the evolution, all the major branches of oaks had been uh, defined. From there on, it was just a matter of adaptive radiation and diversification. So the only group here that we're concerned with tonight is over here, the white oaks, and actually just one small group of the white oaks over here, the Demosi. Uh, this is the group in which Gary Oak is in. There's eight members. This is one of the groups that went off into the summer dry Mediterranean climates of California and down into Mexico. So here are the members of that group. That makes these oaks the most closely related oaks to Gary Oak. Um, so these are all, as I said, California, a little bit down into Mexico. Now, if we look at some of them, 
Turns out Gary Oak hybridizes with some of them. Here is metal scrub oak and leather oak. Both of these are evergreen oaks, uh, but they're close relatives nevertheless. And hybrids with Gary Oak are what they call um, hardily deciduous, but still a deciduous oak. Now, Gary Oak also hybridizes pretty extensively with blue oak, which is another deciduous oak in California. And it hybridizes with valley oak, which is not in the Demosi group at all. So not all that closely related, but it's still hybridizes with them. Uh, and to extend that story a little farther, since the Eastern white oak has been brought west and planted in cities, uh, Gary Oak hybridizes with it too. So actually this is an oak thing. A lot of different oaks do extensive hybridization. And interestingly, most of the hybrids are fertile and they cross back into the parent populations. And so this is actually a vehicle for harvesting diverse genes from other, from other species and moving them back into their own population. And then they later utilize these to be able to adapt to new habitats. And it's thought that this is one of the reasons they become so uh, diverse. In fact, at this point, uh, they're counting 600 plus species of, uh, of oak. Not too long ago, if you'd uh, looked that up, it would be 400 or 450, but uh, they're finding more and more and more. So extensive hybridization is a characteristic of oaks in general and Gary Oak in particular. Now there's three varieties of uh, Gary Oak that have been recognized over the years. The only one we have up here in the Northwest is variety Garyana. Now, normally that's considered to be a tree variety and it would be the biggest tree of the bunch. Uh, but in fact, you can find it in shrubby forms in particularly harsh environments. So it is the Northwest down to about central California. But we also have variety Samota. This is the one that heads all the way down to Los Angeles. It's kind of a stubby tree. So it does have basically a tree form, sometimes in harsh environments, just like Garyana, you'll find it as a shrub, uh, but uh, a kind of a stubby tree. Brewery, on the other hand, is pretty much always a shrub. And it's just in Southern Oregon and Northern California. Now taxonomists have always been troubled by these varieties. It's very difficult to distinguish them. And guess what? No surprise, they hybridize with each other too. Uh, so it gets very difficult to uh, separate them sometimes. Well, that was investigated by Ken here recently in 2019, a paper was published, and they did a detailed uh, study of um, Gary Oak genetics from top to bottom, all varieties uh, from, the, from the northernmost range down to the southernmost range. And what they say is that the Gary Oak varieties are not well differentiated genetically. And so that kind of raises a the flag. There seem to be a few morphological traits we can use to separate them. But on the whole, it almost looks like we should really be thinking about this as just one incredibly diverse species. Well, these same people um, that did uh, Ken that uh, uh, I was just speaking of, looked also at nuclear DNA and, and also chloroplast DNA. Now, chloroplast DNA is separate from the nucleus. It's inherited separately. It's passed strictly along the maternal lines. So it never passes through pollen. It is passed strictly uh, into the egg straight from the uh, maternal line. So if we're looking at a single haplotype, the implication is that we're probably looking at a single maternal line. Now, up until just a few years ago, there had been a, only a couple studies of genetics of Gary Oak. They were all done up in this northern part. And the conclusion of those studies was that Gary Oak is a singularly undiverse species genetically. Well, when Ken came out with their uh, paper, that was shown to be true, if that's all you looked at was this northern population. But as soon as you got into Southern Oregon and Northern California, genetic diversity skyrockets. And there's tremendous genetic diversity. This is the true center of diversity 
Fregario right down here. It tails off a little bit into Southern California, but there's still quite a bit down there. But as you go north, you end up with basically just two haplotypes. And by the time you get to Vancouver Island, just one. So why this pattern? Well, this has to do with the Pleistocene Ice Age. So there have been repeated advances of ice coming down out of the north and into northern Washington. And so here is just a little uh, image here of the Puget Lobe, which came down into Puget Sound. And so, of course, that was all ice. That was not habitat for any plant at the time. But you can well imagine that here is that lobe. It's just this little tiny thing here with this massive ice sheet up here behind. You can well imagine that the climate for well out in front of that ice sheet was quite cold. Remember, oaks evolved in a warm, long summer environment. They can't complete their life cycle in the cold. And so, of course, any Gary Oak up there at that time would have been would have died out. And Gary Oak then survived down here in Southern Oregon and Northern California, well, perhaps farther down into California into that climate. But that's where it had to survive. All right, so as the ice began to melt back and the climate warmed, then, um, of course, Gary Oak started marching back northwards. And um, there we go. So, uh, but, but the thing is, the only oaks that would be involved in the return march were the very peripheral ones, the northernmost oaks right up there at the very edge, and thus very few maternal lines, and thus very little diversity. So this is actually a thing with many, many species of plants that were forced south and then had to return north again. Uh, it's, it's pretty common for diversity to take a big hit that way. So high diversity or low diversity, it doesn't seem to matter with uh, Gary Oak. Uh, it seems to be able to adopt a lot of shapes in different environments. It can fit into almost anything. So right over here, we have this big, magnificent oak, open grown in a nice, fertile, well-watered area here. And you get these big, massive, beautiful trees. On the other hand, check out this one. This one is growing out of a bedrock fracture on a rocky bald in the Olympic Mountains. It's having a tough time, but it's making it. But look at it. It's squished flat right against the rock, trying to stay warm. Uh, some of these eventually adopt tree form, like this one, if you can call that a tree. Uh, but they're doing the best they can. The fact is, they're there. This is a tough environment, and they're still there. You can also, as we talked about earlier, get into a forest situation where you get kind of spindly, uh, upright trees going straight up and a little puff of foliage kind of flaring out at the top. Now, all of these have about the same genetic potential. If you take an acorn from all of these, plant it out in this field, that'd be known as a common garden experiment. Very likely, you're gonna grow a whole bunch of trees about like this if you give it enough time. And conversely, even if you take an acorn off of here and plant it in the bedrock fracture over here, it's probably going to end up looking about like this. So what we're looking at here is, I guess you could call it the plasticity of the species. It's able to adapt to a lot of different environments with the uh, genetics that it does have. OK, we're going to talk buds for a few minutes here. Um, because this is gonna play into our story when we talk about the relationship of oak with fire. So right here is the terminal winter bud. It's usually surrounded by a few axillary lateral buds. And all of these have within them an entire shoot. So when the next spring comes, there's already a little, a little uh, stem, there's already flowers, there's already leaves, they're all in there, it's just going to puff them up with a lot of water and push them out of the bud. When it does that, that terminal bud takes off here. That's the branch that, that it formed. The lateral buds were these right here. And lo and behold, there's a whole bunch of little tiny buds revealed. Well, where were they? They were actually underneath the bud scales of some of these. Now, these little bud scale scar buds um, are gonna have a very important function in helping in crown recovery after damage. So 
these guys are all going to be dormant at this time. There is a hormonal signal that's coming down the stems here, and that signal is telling them to stay dormant. But should you go out and prune all these branches off or a fire come and burn them off, that signal is no longer there, and they immediately activate, and out will come a bunch of leaves. So this is going to help in crown recovery. We're going to look in more detail at that in a minute. Uh, but as the bark grows on these branches, it's going to actually grow out around these buds, and it's going to bury them. Now, they're going to stay alive. Uh, the estimate is that they'll stay alive for up to 40 years. Uh, and then they still can activate and push their way through the bark when they're needed. Keep in mind that these are produced throughout the life of the tree, so these are going to be found from the highest branches down to the root collar. The entire tree is peppered with these things. Once they're buried in the bark, we call them epicormic buds. Okay, more on that in a minute. Let's look at a cross section, or actually a long section of a bud. We just cut lengthwise down through that. Here are the only living tissues in there. These bud scales at this stage of development are all dead and they're covered with hairs. And those hairs are holding them apart just a little bit so there are air spaces in between the bud scales. This is fantastic insulation. So should a fire come through the area and a pulse of heat hits this bud, it has to work its way all the way through this insulation before it ever gets to living tissue, okay? So this is going to be real important. It's going to be an advantage that, that uh, Gary Oak has over a lot of other species, and especially over Douglas fir, which is going to, as our story goes on, become, uh, you'll, you'll understand, is one of the principal competitors of, uh, of Gary Oak. They don't have this defense system. OK, so let's talk about epicormics a little bit. So up here, we have a tree on a very dry site. And it has suffered a great deal of drought damage. And at some point in the past, it died back quite a ways. Well, those little epicormics have now responded now that the, uh, uh, the uh, drought seems to be over. You can see these little, what I call little pom-poms, little round uh, bunches of leaves. Those are those clusters of buds activating and pushing leaves out. And so that's kind of the signature of a tree that's in recovery uh, with its epicormic buds. But down here, we have a tree in which a fire burned underneath it, hot enough that the heat rose up to the canopy and cooked all the branches down to a certain size. Branches that were bigger than that, uh, it, didn't, it didn't absorb enough heat to actually kill all the tissues. And so from that point all the way down, the tree lives. But those outer branches are all dead. Well, you can see those epicormics activating here, little puffs of leaves coming out. And I can tell you, because this was in our acorn survey, and we followed this tree for 18 years, that um, this tree made a full recovery and actually got burned again the same way and made a full recovery from that. So this is really an amazing recovery mechanism uh, that, that oaks are, are capable of doing. We'll talk about acorns for a few minutes here. So acorns are fall germinators. Um, they have a high percentage of germination so long as they're not damaged. And we're going to talk about some of the damaging uh, mechanisms in a few minutes. Basically, in the fall, um, they will fall from the tree. And as soon as you get a little bit of rain coming down, that's the signal and they go. I've actually seen these things germinating while they're still on the tree. They've got this radical just pushing right out and they're still hanging on the tree. So they are ready to go just as soon as there's some moisture. Now, these are large seeds. Now, that has some good benefits, but it has some real problems attached to it also. One of the problems is poor self-dispersal, OK? These things fall right under the tree. And that's a horrible place to be if you're a baby oak tree. You don't want to grow up underneath your parents. You're an immediate competition. And you're going to lose. So it's not a good place to be. And so we're going to have to talk about how they get out from under the tree. There is a way, uh, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. But they're really good at rapid establishment. Lots of nutrition in here. They can put out this big, massive taproot, send it down in the soil deeply enough 
to ward off the, the coming summer drought. That means they can get it down there and tap into some water better than most other uh, species. So this is a good drought adaptation. But guess what? All that nutrition attracts a lot of predators. Okay, almost everything out there wants to eat the acorn. So the tree has had to evolve a defense, which is called masking. They produce mast crops. Now, what's that? Well, it'll produce an enormous crop one year, and then it's gonna produce almost nothing, very little for several years in a row. And then another enormous crop. Those enormous crops are called the mast crops. Now, what's it doing? It's making sure that the seed predators cannot ever get dependent on this tree for food. Basically, it's gonna starve them for a few years, and then it's gonna inundate them with so much food they can't eat it all, and so there's something left over to be established for new trees. Now, we did an acorn survey for 18 years, and during that time, we came across three universal mast years for the Pacific Northwest. Now, what does that mean? Well, we studied acorns from up in Vancouver Island, through down to Southern Oregon, through the Columbia Gorge and into the east side of uh, the Cascades in Washington and Oregon. It didn't matter where you were in those three years, whether you're up on Vancouver Island or whether you were down in Medford, Oregon, or whether you were over at Goldendale, Washington, it didn't matter there was a big crop. So that's what we mean by universal mastery. Now, you could get some smaller masking uh, events that were um, just here or there, but these three were throughout the Pacific Northwest. So it makes us think that there are some, at least on occasion, some pretty strong climatic controls on masking. Okay, the last point here. These nuts have very high water content. Well, that's what makes them makes it possible for them to activate and grow so rapidly. But it has some problems. They're easily killed by desiccation and heat. So if these acorns fall off the tree onto bare ground in the heat of the summer, um, they probably only have a few days to live. And then they're going to be too desiccated to germinate. If they're on the ground when a fire comes through, unless that fire passes really fast or unless they're buried a little bit, that's going to be too much heat and it's going to kill them. So they are vulnerable uh, both to drying and to fire when they're on the ground. So there are also some regional and environmental uh, differences in acorn production uh, that we found in the survey. So we found that trees growing in the Willamette Valley, Puget Sound, that uh, Puget Willamette trough, uh, were the worst producers. So all you have to know here is an acorn class of one means no acorns are produced in that year, and a four means lots of them. So we're down here 1.5, 1.6, down in the basement for Puget Sound and Willamette Valley. Of course, there's some trees that produce well and a whole bunch that didn't, so we get that uh, low value. Well, um, remember, they evolved up in that warm, uh, wet summer uh, environment, and here we have a summer dry environment, so that's kind of like strike one. And when you compare these two areas to Southern Oregon, uh, the Klickitat or the Eastern end of the gorge, it's cooler than those areas. So cool and dry, strike one and strike two, worse production. If you come over here, now we've got a warm area in Southern Oregon, Eastern Washington and Oregon and Eastern end of the gorge, all warm but dry. Well, so we only have strike one, it's dry. Now, if you take trees over here in this cool dry area and add water, that would be riparian, it improves a little bit. So it comes up and joins this group right here. So now it's just um, uh, cool and, and moist. So where do you get your best production? Well, we don't have in Western United States a warm and wet climate but you can approximate that by going to a warm place like east of the Cascades, a nice, sunny, long, warm um, environment for the summer and add water, have them grow right next to a creek or something like that. And voila, lots of production. So this is where acorns really get produced. Of course, there's not an awful lot of this out there, but um, that's the best production and that's my interpretation of why. Well, who eats acorns? Well, 
I guess the more appropriate question is right here. Who doesn't? Okay, long lists of things that eat acorns. We're not going to talk about them all. We're going to talk about the ones that are in yellow. Uh, we'll talk a lot about people. People not only ate a lot of acorns, and by the way, people all around the world in the past have, have eaten acorns. And probably the only reason we're not eating them nowadays is because no one has figured out how to make these trees stop masting. Nowadays, if you want a commercial crop of something, it's got to produce every year, not every three, four, or five, or six years. Um, but in the past, it was still a very valuable food resource, and people ate a lot of the acorns. We're going to talk about Western gray squirrels, and we're going to talk about Stellar's jays. Not only do they eat acorns, but this is the ticket out from underneath the tree. These guys are the dispersers, and I suspect people were too in the day, but these are the main dispersers. This is how they get out from under the tree. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we also have to talk about Curculio weevils and filbert worms because they are so destructive of acorn crops. In a given year, they might take 50 to 100% of the crop. So we can't exactly ignore them. So let's talk about them first. So here is a Curculio. And she is drilling a hole in an immature acorn. It's so immature, it hasn't even pooched out of the, the cap yet. Here's the cap. She's going to lay an egg in that hole. That larvae is going to crawl down inside. And there it has its little habitation. It's insulated. Uh, the oak tree is going to keep pumping nourishment and moisture into there. And it's going to grow right along with that acorn, consuming the inside of the acorn as it grows. And when it finally gets big enough and mature enough, it's going to chew a hole through the, through the uh, shell of the nut. It's going to crawl out, drop to the ground, pupate, and be ready for the next season. Now, the filbert moth has a similar life cycle, except that she is not going to drill in. She's going to lay her egg just somewhere close to an acorn, on a twig or something like that. It's going to hatch out into a caterpillar that's going to crawl over, find a nut, uh, chew its way through, and basically go through the same kind of life cycle as these guys. So when it's finally mature enough. It will chew a hole in the nut as well. It will crawl out. It will fall down to the, uh, the forest floor there. And there it will pupate as well. So those are the life cycles of two of the most destructive insects of, uh, of acorns. But suppose you make it past that gauntlet. There's another one waiting for you when you get to the ground because almost everybody down there wants to eat an acorn as well. So um, it's been estimated from some studies that half or more than half of the crop will be consumed once it gets to the ground by vertebrates. And if that's not enough, remember we talked about the uh, tendency for these acorns to dehydrate on the ground. Uh, it's been estimated that up to or even more than 40% of the acorns down there can die due to desiccation alone. So there you have it. Um, if you do the math, even in a big crop, there's not really all that, that much left over to, um, to supply new trees. And they still have to get out from under that tree. Well, that's where we go now. So acorn dispersal, largely by Western gray squirrels and Stellar's jays, and possibly in the past by people. Okay. Now, other squirrels can disperse acorns too. Um, and even the introduced Eastern gray squirrel will scatter hoard very similarly to the Western gray squirrel. But other critters than that might accidentally disperse an acorn once in a while, but nothing that the tree can count on. So it's really these up here that we want to talk about. So let's talk about the Western gray first. Now, they do what we call scatter hoarding, which means they're going to hide acorns just one at a time here or there. And they can take them up to 650 feet from the tree. Of course, most of them aren't going to be that far, but it's still out from under the canopy of that tree where it can get its own sunshine and not compete with its parent. And on top of that, they're going to hide them. They don't want another critter to come along and eat them. So they're going to bury them an inch and a half to two inches deep. They're planted. Now, of course, that squirrel's going to get hungry in the winter and come back and find them, and it's going to eat some of them. But they almost always hide more than they need. So there's going to be nuts out there that are going to grow under trees. 
a handy way of actually getting yourself planted. Just feed a squirrel a few nuts in the wintertime and voila, you get, you get your uh, dispersal and your planting at the same time. But even better are the Stellar's Jays because they have been documented taking them 2,000 feet from a tree and suspect that they might take them farther, maybe even more than half of a mile from a tree. And they plant them too, or at least most of them. So here is a really efficient dispersal agent. And think about how the oaks made it after the last ice age from the California border up to Vancouver, most likely step by step, it was probably these guys that did the work. So people, big consumers, at least in the past. Well, here's the deal with acorns. They're very, very bitter tasting. They have a lot of tannins in them. This doesn't mean that they're really toxic, but you can get a bellyache by eating too many of them raw. But the native peoples found that tannins are water soluble and they can leach them out simply by putting them in some moving water. Uh, so uh, what they did was they would find a place where water, excuse me, I went back the wrong way, where water is moving through the soil like this, they could dig a hole down into that uh, mud or gravel or whatever, and put a basket, a big basket of acorns down in there, bury it, cover it over, and then forget about it for a while. And over the next few months, the water would leach all the tannins out. And since it's buried in there, it doesn't have any oxygen, there's no decomposition, so it's a food storage mechanism as well. So at the very end of the winter, uh, when other food supplies are getting low and hard to find, you've got this magnificent cache of good, nutritious, now sweet nuts. Well, Crows et al. Uh, did a study of a former village site down on Sabi's Island uh, where this kind of leaching had been done. And they found in a stretch of beach, uh, Sabi's Island's near Portland, for those of you who don't know, Portland, Oregon, they found in a stretch of beach about 150 meters long, 114 leaching pits. And Matthews here estimated that there were about 2,500,000 acorns in those leaching pits. Think about this. This is the take of one village for one season. So it was a pretty big business back in the day. Okay, so in 1830, Hudson's Bay Company, Fort Vancouver had already been established for quite some time. Um, and in came a ship called the Owyhee, carrying some supplies and probably looking for some furs to uh, carry out, but also carrying tropical mosquitoes because they had just been down in the tropics that were infected with malaria. Uh, those mosquitoes got loose. Soon the, the uh, malaria was into the native mosquitoes and it spread like wildfire. And in, in August, there was a huge epidemic of malaria. At Fort Vancouver, just about everybody got sick with malaria. And at one point, there were 83 people flat on their backs and only two people still standing to try to care for them. It was a disaster in the making, but they did have quinine bark in their medicine chest. And while they were still sick and down, in came a supply ship that happened to have some more quinine bark. Quinine can be used to treat malaria. So with the quinine and a little bit of help like that, they eventually got back to health. It took about a month. But when they finally got back to health, they thought, geez, we better go check on the native uh, village uh, across the river on Saudi's Island. So here's what Peter Skinogden wrote in part. He said, in close contiguity with our clearances was a village containing 60 families of Indians. A few miles lower down was a second of at least equal population. A short month had passed away. All, all was changed. Silence reigned where erst the din of population resounded loud and lively. Well, did you wonder why those acorns were left on the beach? 
there was simply no one left to eat them. Malaria ravaged tribes up and down the lower Columbia, up the Willamette. Chinookan peoples, Calipuan peoples uh, were decimated. They didn't have quinine bark to treat the disease. And it took down village after village after village. And it came back for several years beyond that. This was the beginning of a huge cultural and ecological change in the Pacific Northwest. Well, let's get back to the biology for a few minutes and we will actually come back to that other story in a while too. But first of all, let's talk about how uh, acorns grow right, right from the beginning. So as we said, they germinate in the fall and then they will rapidly, rapidly extract the seed reserves from the nut into this long fleshy taproot. This taproot is the growth of the winter and spring. Uh, and the idea is that there's going to be a jay or a squirrel that's going to be back pretty soon for a dessert. And so get that nutrition out, put it where you can use it. Don't spend a lot of time on the top because this is also going to help get you through the summer drought that's sure to come. So it kind of solves two problems, uh, saves your nutrition and gets you ready for the coming summer drought. Um, so shoots undergo little development. And in fact, oaks will prioritize root over shoot development throughout their life. And this is going to have some interesting implications for how it's going to be able to compete and where it's going to be able to compete with other plants. But it does have some real advantages. Uh, so in getting established in a dry place, for example, uh, and also for surviving fires, because you can burn the top of this off and you've got your little epicormic buds down here and you've got a huge food reserve down here, you can regenerate the top. In fact, Hibbs and Yoder here did a study showing that this happens in the drier parts of the Willamette Valley, that what it'll do is in its younger growth there, it's gonna put up a, a short top, put out its leaves, do its photosynthesis, send it down to the root so that the root can grow bigger. And then when the summer drought hits and the root's not quite big enough yet, the top dies back. Then it does it again the next year, maybe a little bit bigger that year. Um, put out its leaves, photosynthesate, send it down to the roots to grow that root even bigger, and then sacrifice the top. The root's still not quite big enough to supply enough water, that top dies back. Do it again. And finally, when the root gets big enough and taps into a good enough supply of water, the next top that comes up is going to not even look back, it's going to grow into the tree. But they found it can do this for up to 21 years. Uh, so this is a interesting way of, of, of establishing on droughty environments. And as you'll see, it's actually superior to almost any other tree in the Northwest in this regard. It's also useful for surviving fires. So here's a fairly substantial tree that's been completely killed in the top, but with the buds, and the huge root reserves that are down there, it's gonna sprout out. This tree is still very much alive. Yeah, it lost its top, but it's lived to, uh, to uh, grow a new one. Okay, so oak grows in a lot of different habitats. So up here, we have um, some oaks growing at Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington. I want you to notice this wall of Douglas fir in the back. What you don't see here is there's a gravel road separating this little savanna here from that wall of Douglas fir. And that gravel road is used as a fire line. So everything on this side of the road gets burned on a regular basis and nothing on that side does. If you did not burn this in the foreground, those firs are gonna march right across this open area, grow up much taller than these trees, smother them, and develop just a pretty normal, ordinary, everyday Douglas fir forest with a salal understory. Uh, so it is the fire that they run through here regularly that is killing the little Doug fir seedlings, which you know are establishing. That's quite a seed rain that that's going to produce. So the fire is killing those when they're young and vulnerable and keeping this in grassland and not hurting the oak trees. 
Now down here at the Whetstone Savannah near Medford, Oregon, a little different situation, but it actually looks pretty similar. We've got another savanna, we've got grassland under it. Fire does burn through there. They've used prescribed burning there also. Um, but this uh, site is much hotter and drier and um, conifers are much less likely to be able to invade here. So here we have a situation where the oaks are not that much challenged by conifers, okay? Now over here, we have trees growing along the banks of a creek in Finley National Wildlife uh, Refuge, a forested environment. Uh, it is probably likely that conifers could come in along the creek side uh, if they can get introduced there. Uh, but um, right now, you've got a good solid growth of uh, oak right there. But there are wetlands where oak is pretty much unchallenged. Over here, we have an oak growing right next to a saltwater wetland. This is Oak Bay. This is a pickleweed or salicornia wetland. This tree has got its roots right down in contact with salt water. It's doing great. This was in our survey and it was a good acorn producer. By the way, this is where Archibald Menzies strolled along the beach and came across oaks back in 1792. Uh, so this is that site that I was referring to. Now over here, we have a slew sedge wetland completely dominated by oaks. Here, conifers cannot grow. It is too wet for conifers. So interestingly enough, we actually have a little corner way out on the wet end of the spectrum where oak might be considered a climax species. It's unchallenged by any other species of tree. You might get some Oregon ash in here, but other than that, um, it's, it's pretty unchallenged. So why aren't they everywhere? They can grow on dry, rocky bulbs. They can grow on savannas in Medford. They can grow in loose edge wetlands. Well, remember, first of all, there are some environmental limits. Um, they need those long, warm summers. So you're not gonna find them growing high in the mountains and you're not gonna find them growing a lot farther north in Canada than where you find them right now. Of course, that could change with global warming, but right now that's pretty much the limit. Um, but really, in all those lowland areas where it has potential habitat, where it grows is pretty much determined by how it competes with conifers, and in particular, with Douglas fir. So here is the oak, okay, Gary oak. Everything else here are Douglas firs. I can tell you that this is a doomed oak. This oak is not going to make it. Even a tree that's this much shorter than it, the Douglas fir, is going to easily outgrow it, overtop it, cut off its light, and this tree will die. Unless, unless people come to its rescue, thin out these dug firs around here, and then it will do just fine. This idea that people can rescue oaks is gonna be a large part of the rest of our story. Keep in mind, Maximum height for Gary Oaks, somewhere around 70 feet. All of the conifers that it might compete with can grow twice that high and much more. Not only that, Gary Oaks not only shorter, but it's much slower growing than those conifers are. So it really doesn't have a chance unless something, and that something is most often going to be people, levels the playing field. Well, that brings us to this topic, and we kind of touched on it with the wetlands, but are there other places where Gary Oak could be the climax species? And the answer is yes, um, but not extensively. So Gary Oak is cereal to conifers wherever conifers can grow. So west of the Cascades, that's almost everywhere, until you get down into Southern Oregon and Northern California, by the way. Uh, but uh, east of the Cascades, in most of the areas where Gary Oak grows, it's going to be cereal to Douglas fir and Ponderosa pine. But there are a few places where you might consider it climax. So this map right here is actually the product of a model. And this model is showing you the potential growth areas for different species. So this purpley color 
over in here, that is what we would call the Western Hemlock Zone. And in this area, given centuries of time, we would expect Western Hemlock to be the climax dominant species. But before it gets there, it's almost always dominated by Douglas fir for very long periods of time. In the green area, this is what we call the Douglas fir zone. And in that area, Douglas fir is gonna be the climax dominant species. Yellow, thunder is a pine, that's the climax dominant species. What's left over is these little blue fringe here and a little bit down in Southern Oregon. That's what we would call the Gary Oak zone. So these fringe areas out on the edge that are too dry and hot for conifers to grow, that would be where Gary Oak might be a climax species. All the rest of these areas, all this colored stuff here, Gary Oak is physiologically capable of growing, okay? But it can only grow there if something keeps the conifers away. And that something is going to end up being people most of the time. It's not gonna grow in these white and brown areas, either the high mountains, it's too cold, doesn't have its long summers. Out here, it's just way too dry uh, for any of the tree species, that's sagebrush steppe and, and grasslands. Um, so um, all of this colored area, it has the potential to grow. In. So here's an example of that fringe area. This is in the Columbia Hills uh, in Washington. You can see it's not exactly that big magnificent tree we saw growing in that field a little while ago. But on the other hand, it's completely unchallenged by conifers. They simply can't get established out here. And Gary Oak can remember how it generates that great big taproot that goes down. Uh, conifers don't do that. In fact, the conifers and Douglas fir in particular have the exact opposite uh, strategy. They prioritize top growth over root growth. So they are kind of a go for broke tree. And wherever there's enough moisture in the soil, that's a great um, uh, strategy because obtaining height advantage over another tree pretty much ensures that you'll win. But if you're gonna die in the process from drought, well, game over, right? And this is where oak can now be a climax dominant species. But that doesn't cover a lot of ground, does it? So how do we get oaks to dominate in all of that area where they're physiologically capable, but they're gonna to have to compete with conifers? Well, the method is gonna be through fire. And this is what native peoples discovered a long, long time ago, uh, that you can burn the understories and eliminate the conifers while they're simply seedlings and preserve the oak trees. Okay, so we did some prescribed burning at Joint Base Lewis McCord so that we could study its effect on the trees and its acorn production. When we sent this really low intensity burn through, we got virtually no damage to the trees. Afterwards, the leaves are nice and green. Got a little bit of scorch. You got an eye for it back there, that kind of light colored foliage there. Uh, but basically, the fire went through, killed any um, conifer seedlings, killed the shrubs. And so we're going to favor the grassland species and the oak with this kind of a system here. And we can push that a little bit more. So here's a much hotter fire. Um, this is burning in some really dry scotch broom. It's a, it's a really hot fire going into those trees. What we got after that was, um, went backwards, I'm sorry again. What we got after that were trees that had scorch all the way at the top. See that funny color? The leaves didn't actually burn. We didn't actually have flames shooting out the top of the trees, but the leaves all died, okay? Now down here in the bottom, we do have some that burned out. But the next spring, these are the same trees, the, uh, not even the epichromic buds, but the regular buds, remember how insulated they are? That was enough insulation to get them through this fire. They leafed out just fine. We lost a few lower limbs, but other than that, the trees are fine. They did not flower, and so they didn't produce an acorn crop in that year. But 
the next year and after that, they're fine in that regard as well. So once again, we've eliminated any competition from conifers and shrubs, and we favored grasslands and we favored the oaks. So let's look at this diagrammatically a little bit. <clears throat> so in Western Washington, Western Oregon, specifically for this diagram in the Western Hemlock Zone, but we could apply something similar to the Doug Fir Zone and the Ponder of the Pine Zone. Um, we have this kind of a fire cycle. So if you have a Douglas fir forest and it burns in a forest fire, it's gonna cycle back here. You know, you're gonna get herbs, shrubs, tree seedlings. The seedlings are most likely gonna be Douglas fir because it's such an aggressive tree on these burns. And that's gonna grow up into a closed canopy forest. And now you've got a very shady understory. Uh, neither Douglas fir nor Gary Oak is gonna be able to uh, survive in that understory. And given enough time, lots of time, hemlock, which can be established in those shady understories, would become the climax dominant tree by tree as these old bugs die. It would replace them. But in the Pacific Northwest, we rarely have that much time before the next fire comes back. We have fire cycles at the short end, maybe 70 years at the long end, 300 to 500 years. Rarely do we actually get into this range. Most of the time in 300 years or less, it's gonna cycle right back over here and start over again. So around and around and around it goes in the Pacific Northwest. Now, do you see any room for Gary Oak in there? Well, there isn't. There isn't any habitat for Gary Oak in most parts of the Pacific Northwest if you had nothing but this totally natural cycle. So how do you get Gary Oak into the picture? Well, it requires people and it requires frequently repeated fire. But in the Pacific Northwest, we don't have a way to get frequently repeated fire because we don't have enough thunderstorms uh, to do the job. Um, and a lot of our thunderstorms come in the springtime when it's wet, so we don't get fires out of them. So it requires people. And why would people want to do this? There's almost nothing to eat in these forests, but there's a lot to eat in prairies and oak savannas. So when you get people involved and you increase the fire frequency, let's say one to three years, you'll have a prairie. Now, that cycle is so frequent that not even a Gary Oak is gonna be able to establish out there. Just the second it germinates, a fire comes along and kills it. So this is a prairie environment and there's a lot to eat on the prairie. Camas, for example, and it's not just the plant foods out there. The uh, game like deer and elk like to come out on the prairie. They're hard to hunt over in this dense forest. You have to get really close to them. And in the prairie, it's, it's a lot easier to, uh, to see them and you can sneak up on them and, and, uh, and hunt them. Well, if you back that fire cycle off just a little bit, well, now you can start recruiting some oaks. You still have the grassland flora, but now you have acorns too. So you got acorns and camas. So you've kind of doubled your money. So native peoples learned in a hurry to manage large pieces of landscape in this in this uh, system right here, either prairie or oak savanna. Now, if you back off the fire cycle too much, you recruit too many trees. And when you do that, you'll probably also get some dug fir in there. But now you're gonna have a shady understory and that's gonna grow shrubs. And so now you've got a lot of fuels. Now you've got a dicey situation if you're gonna try to burn that. Chances are it's gonna be catastrophic and kill all the trees in there. So, this wasn't something that was directly managed for. This might've been something that was out of the fringe. So you might be burning your prairies and your savannas on one of these cycles. And once in a while, the fire would burn out a little bit farther, but not every, every time. So you might get some woodlands either along riparian areas or out of the fringe of your prairies and savannas. Now, here's the key though. If people ever stop burning, it doesn't matter which of these stages you're in, it starts sliding off into the classic uh, Doug Fir successional cycle. It'll fill up with Doug Fir. The next time it burns, it's coming back over here, not to any of this, okay? So by not keeping up with the burning, you lose all of this. 
you lose all the diversity that's in it, you lose all the food potential that's in it, you lose it all if you just stop this burning cycle. So in most places, the replacement of oaks and grassland flora by conifer forest will occur without deliberate human intervention with fire. And what does that mean? That means that nearly all Gary Oak habitat in the Northwest owes its very existence to past native burning. So here's the scorecard between Doug Fir that we've talked about and Gary Oak, okay? All of this selection that we're doing with fire is happening in the seedling sapling stage. Neither one of these trees is tall enough to avoid the heat at that stage. Now, if a dug fir can grow to its full height, of course, the grass fire is going to burn right under it and not bother the, uh, the uh, buds up in the top of the tree, and it's going to have thick bark at that point. It won't bother the tree then. So if it's during the seedling and sapling stage, though, it doesn't have those advantages. And Gary Oak does have an advantage. It has insulated buds, so it's going to fare better in these, uh, in these burns. Douglas fir doesn't have that. Now, that at that particular stage of development, they both have rather thin bark. They can be damaged in that way. Um, but Gary Oak has extensive epicormic buds. Doug fir, not so much. Gary Oak has excellent root reserves. Doug fir, not so much. Gary oak resprouts from the base, Doug fir does not. So oak wins in a fire regime uh, where you have frequent enough fire to prevent Douglas fir from ever getting beyond the sapling stage. And likewise, prairie vegetation wins when fire is frequent enough to prevent shrubs and trees from getting beyond the seedling stage. Okay. So the West Side Story summed up in two quotations here. The first by David Douglas, speaking about the Willamette Valley in the 1820s. He says, country undulating, soil rich, light with beautiful solitary oaks and pines, interspersed throughout it, but being all burned, camped on the side of a low woody stream in the center of a small plain, which like the whole of the country I have passed through is burned. Now we're not talking about native peoples burning a little patch here and a little patch there. They thought big, they burned big. Um, the burning in the Willamette Valley was so extensive that when uh, the Hudson's Bay Company trappers journeyed south through the Willamette Valley to get to the mountains in Southern Oregon and Northern California to do their trapping, they had a, a terrible problem feeding their horses. There wasn't enough forage for them. So we're talking about mile upon mile upon mile burned over land. This is not a small thing. Well, let's fast forward about uh, 30 to 40 years here. And we have a quotation from J.G. Cooper, who was in 1859, the botanist for some railroad surgeons. He says, on some prairies near Vancouver and Nisqually, where this burning has been prevented for 20 years past, young spruces are found to be growing up rapidly. And Indians have told me that they can remember when some other prairies were much larger than at present. So observers like Cooper could see exactly what was going on in 1859. So it's not like we didn't know. We've known if we just pay attention to these people for a long time, that these were places that were maintained by native people in a very extensive way and that in a short time after the burning was stopped, trees started moving in rapidly. So native peoples tended Gary Oak savannas and prairies for at least 5,000 years and possibly much longer. And we know this because we have studied the climate quite a lot. And we know that for at least the last 5,000 years, the climate has been conducive for dominance of Douglas fir and other conifers, not Gary Oak. In other words, if people were not burning during that time, Gary Oak would have been crowded out a long time ago and would have had no way to make its way back in. The displacement of native culture had huge ecological consequences. And the ecological collapse of Gary Oak woodlands and prairies was precipitated 
by greed and ignorance. So Gary Oak can grow in much of the Northwest, but only if conifers are kept from competing with it. Native people achieve this with frequent prescribed burning. So we know that management is required and prescribed burning is still the most practical method to maintain large areas for both oaks and its associated grasslands. So Gary Oak isn't becoming extinct. It's not even a particularly rare uh, species. But as people occupy ever more landscape, the plant communities in which it grows are becoming increasing, increasingly rare and degraded. Okay, it's the plant communities that it grows in that we really need to focus on. And as this happens, management is becoming increasingly difficult. So this is not about biology or ecology. We know enough about that to know what to do. It's about people. It's about their connection to the land and their will to support restorative efforts. So thank you. That's my story. And I would entertain questions. Hi, I'm going to jump back in here. That was fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing all your insightful background on Gary Oak, Oregon White Oak. Um, I know there's at least one question in the chat and I'll get to that in a moment. If folks have a mic, they can unmute and click on the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And that will be a way you can ask questions without having to type them out. And right now I see there are some questions in Q&A, so I'll go there first. Okay, um, oh, they were hellos. Okay, do Gary Oaks do well in windy areas? In windy areas? Windy um, areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's no problem with that. Um, the, they're actually a fairly wind firm tree. Um, they root um, fairly deeply and quite broadly. Uh, so assuming they don't have something like root rod or something like that, they should do quite well. Okay, and there's a question here from Annette. Recently, I heard that our Gary Oaks are not native to Western Washington, but brought here from Oregon by the fur companies or similar. Do you think there is any merit in this idea? Uh, no. Uh, we have Gary Oak trees that are far, far, far older than the fur trapping enterprise here. Um, there have been trees up in the neighborhood of 600 years old found. Uh, I've personally aged trees that were over 300 years. Uh, so they very clearly were here long, long before that. Okay. And is planting an acorn the best way to grow Gary Oak and what plants can be planted under it? Okay, well, um, yeah, planting an acorn is a good way to grow Gary Oak. Um, uh, when you pick your acorn, look closely at it to make sure it doesn't have any signs of a little pinprick hole or something that might indicate that there's a weevil or a moth larvae inside. Um, but if you have a good sound acorn, yeah, plant it and they grow very nicely. Uh, as far as what to put underneath it, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, good native species that will grow under there. If you're looking for other ornamentals or exotics to plant, I, I can't advise you a lot, except that I will warn you that um, they have um, foliage, which when it falls off, the leaf litter is fairly resistant to decomposition uh, and can smother things uh, uh, fairly well. So um, just keep that in mind when you're uh, planting under it, that you may need to clean up the leaves uh, or something like that. Okay. Um, can you touch on the presence of large dug firs in prairies? Sure. Um, when occasionally a Douglas fir tree uh, will get past the fires, um, we're talking about, um, you know, a lot of years that are, that are that they're out there and the fires aren't always totally predictable. Uh, in any uh, given burn, they may miss a spot. 
Maybe that spot has a young aspiring Douglas fir growing there. It'll get up high enough and a thick enough bark that the next fire won't take it down. Well, at that point, it's not even gonna look back. It's gonna grow up large and it's going to thicken its bark and pretty soon be utterly immune to prairie grass fires. And now it can get as big as it needs. The only other thing that can happen is um, in an open grown situation, a lot of times they'll have limbs that come down pretty close to the ground. Now, if those limbs get burned back without torching the whole crown, well, that's the best case scenario. But there is the potential to tor torch the crown. And since they can't regenerate from that, that's the end of that tree. But generally speaking, um, uh, a, a prairie grass fire that's not too hot can pass underneath and maybe just scorch those branches, kill them back, and now the tree is protected. Okay, we have, can Gary Oak tolerate clay heavy soils? Well, it can tolerate almost any soil, uh, but it might depend on the particular situation. Uh, so if you have um, a heavy clay soil, say subsoil, uh, it may actually have difficulty getting its root through it. You have some of this situation I know of down in the Willamette Valley, and a lot of trees have this same problem. And the soil above that clay pan will dry out extensively in the summertime and be a very difficult place for any species of tree to grow. So it can be an issue depending on where that clay soil is, is, is at. Likewise, a heavy clay pan in a wet area um, may perch the water table and may perch it for too long and too deep uh, for even a Gary Oak. Even though Gary Oaks can tolerate quite a bit of wetness, they need to come up for air once in a while. So um, it just depends on, on how it is situated. If you have clay soil and you see other trees growing in it, then probably it's gonna do just fine. Okay. It looks like the USDA manages many Northwest forests by clear cut styles. Would planting Gary Oaks following cuts be a way of creating both conifer and oak mosaics? Uh, yes, and actually this is done a fair bit out at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Believe it or not, the Army does manage their forests quite extensively. They have an entire forestry department that, that does this sort of thing. Um, they don't do so much clear cutting, but they have managed for a combination of conifer and oak in some places. In some places, they've simply released the oaks and turned it back into an oak uh, woodland. In other places, they do kind of a joint management where they simply clear out around individual oaks so that those oaks don't get over top. Uh, but yes, it is possible, but you have to keep in mind that those conifers, um, even in a, uh, a typical rotation age, are still gonna get a lot taller than the oaks. So you're gonna have to keep them away from the oaks a little bit. Now, if you clear cut it and plant it back, remember that the oak seedling is going to grow much more slowly than the conifer seedlings. And so that's not necessarily the best combination right there. Okay, the next question is, uh, a series of at least two questions. Um, assuming we aren't going to vote against people, should we choose then between Doug firs, hemlock forests, and oaks? Is planting Gary oaks better for fighting climate change than Doug fir hemlocks? And will they survive better with climate change? Well, that's a <laughs> an interesting yeah. question that we could go on and on about. Um, the question about um, climate change, um, Gary Oaks uh, are probably going to benefit in the long haul from it. But if you're talking about, you'd have to be specific about the location. So if we're talking about a place like Western Washington, even with fairly extensive climate change, we're probably not going to be too much different than, say, hmm, down Central Oregon, Central Western Oregon, or something like that. Um, the point is that um, if you're at the very southern end of 
Gary Oak's uh, distribution where it is still in, in contact with conifers, uh, then the answer might be, yeah, maybe Gary Oak's the better one to plant because um, with all the fires and the warmer climate, the conifers are probably going to be burned out and it's probably gonna end up too dry for them. But as you get farther north than that, you're gonna have all the same issues that we have right now. It's simply gonna be a question of diversity and what you want to have on the landscape. So um, they are certainly going to be a little more competitive uh, than they used to be, but they're not gonna be out competing the conifers throughout most of their range. Uh, maybe just in the very southern end of it. Okay, when a parent oak dies from drought or fire, root sprouts can grow up to produce rings of trees. These clumps are clonal, consisting of multiple ramets sharing the same genet. On joint base Lewis McCord, the largest number of ramets I observed that came from the same genet. 16, and that's from Jeff Foster. I'm not sure I pronounce things right. It's more of a comment, I suppose, than a yeah. question. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and Jeff's absolutely right. Jeff uh, was the ecologist out at uh, JBLM for many years, and, and uh, he's made a lot of observations. Yeah, when you, you kill the top of the tree and it sprouts out from that uh, root collar, you get a lot of ramets coming up. And yes, they are all genetically identical. They are the tree that was killed. That's what they are. You see these rings of uh, older trees uh, fairly commonly that developed in just this way. It can develop from a fire killing the uh, parent tree or it can develop from someone going out and cutting one down and it'll sprout. So sometimes we see uh, these uh, rings of trees uh, and we, we actually suspect that, oh, that was probably some uh, pioneer that cut the tree down for fence posts or something like that. But yeah, they do uh, sprout vigorously from that root collar there. And uh, lots of these sprouts come up. Eventually, they tend to thin out. Uh, some of them become more dominant than others. Uh, but um, yeah, you generally end up with multiple trunks. And it's... Uh, uh, it's Interesting to see. Linda Storm asks, are your slides going to be made available? I would love a copy of your presentation. <laughs> well, um, my slides, uh, you, you probably notice at the one that's up on, I don't know if we're still sharing the screen, the one that was up at the end there has the name Reese Lolly on it. These aren't all my pictures. Um, I, I've tried to give credit wherever there wasn't a name that was my picture. But um, a lot of these are, 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 are slides from other people. Uh, some things I got off of the internet. Um, and uh, so there's quite a collection. I personally don't mind if you folks use the pictures. I, that's, that's fine with me. Um, so if they can be made available, that's, that's, that's OK. Uh, but I would just let you know that they aren't all mine to give away. And you can, you can watch the recording of this program on the WMPS website once it's posted in a few days. So you can come back and watch it again. Okay, we have at least one or two more, but I know we need to try to wrap them up. At least three more questions here. Okay, Samantha asks, up in the San Juan Islands, it appears that we have had dug for oak woodlands for a long time. Do you think this is due to the variability in topography and fires were more patchy here? Um, the San Juan Islands um, once had fairly extensive uh, prairies and savannas, and there were much less Douglas fir. Douglas fir has been invading those prairies and savannas for quite a long time now. Um, so the answer is fairly a little more complex. Um, you've, you've certainly had the mix of Douglas fir and oak uh, for a very, very long time, but the proportions of the two species of trees have been changing ever since um, uh, settlers put an end to Indian burning uh, on the San Juans. So at one time, there was a lot more open ground. 
There was a lot more camas growing. There were oaks that uh, were being harvested for their acorns as well. And then after the settlers moved in, started building houses on the prairies and saying, hey, wait a minute, burning these prairies is a danger for our houses. Uh, they put an end to it. And ever since then, Douglas firs have been uh, crowding in. Now the San Juans are in the Olympic rain shadow. It's quite dry there. So the process there is taking longer than some other places. Some other places this happens much faster, but it is happening there just the same. And Van says the book Restoring the Pacific Northwest states that the retreat of glaciers was followed by a warm dry period that favored the northward spread of oaks. Then the climate cooled and became wetter resulting in the shrinkage of the range of oaks. Do you agree with this statement? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, and I, it, it pained me. I trying to put this talk together at one point, I had some slides in about this whole subject and I just, I just couldn't put it all in there. So I had to take them out, <clears throat> but yes, no, it, it, did, it did warm quite a lot after the ice retreated. The ice retreated amazingly fast. The climate did a, a real about face. Uh, it became quite warm. And we don't know if it ever got to the point where oaks could have possibly been a climax species on the west side. I doubt that, but I think that there's no question that that's when they made their move northward. Um, and then of course, that's what I was saying, about 5,000 years ago, it really got so wet that it's untenable to think that um, they wouldn't have been dominated by conifers. Now, the question is between about um, the 14,500 years when the, when the glaciers started melting back and that 5,000 mark, were there, was there a time in there when without supplementary burning, uh, they would have survived just fine? Don't know the answer to that. Uh, I suspect that they've probably been getting some help from peoples throughout most of that time. And it was probably, it was probably back about the time the climate changed that the, uh, the cultural tradition of burning really got cemented in because now the native peoples were literally fighting to hold on to a landscape that they had adapted to that was feeding them. So while the climate changed and things got wetter, they started getting things like cedar and they adapted to that and used it for a lot of things, but they also held on to their prairies, uh, which grew camas and acorns and all kinds of things. Uh, they held on to that by doing extensive burning. And that's why we still have oak. Uh, if that hadn't happened, we simply wouldn't have oak up here. So what about using Gary Oak in power line corridors where conifers will never be permitted to grow? Well, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> I've, I've looked at power line corridors any number of times and said, why are we wasting this opportunity? We should have a prairie growing here and we could put oaks that aren't too tall. Uh, you'd have to convince the power companies that this was an okay thing to do. But the one thing I would say is once again, um, you know, everybody loves a tree and everybody overlooks the fact that the really rare plants are underneath those trees. So I would say, let's broaden our view and, um, and, and, and try to focus a little bit more on all that other vegetation and Trees, yeah, let's grow some oaks out there too. Okay, so where are the best places to see Gary Oaks? Well, it depends on where you are, of course, but um, yeah, well, there's a broad question. If you're in the South Puget Sound, um, the uh, Scatter Creek Preserve is a great place um, to go. That's, I think, one of the best ones I can, I can think of. Uh, just about any of our, our prairies here do have oaks associated with them. Uh, there's a few out at Mima Mounds. Glacial Heritage is only open uh, to the public one day a year, and that day is coming up. I don't know the exact day, probably within just uh, two or three weeks. Um, so you might Google that one. That's Prairie Appreciation Day. Uh, beautiful prairie, and there's oaks out there. If you're up in the North Sound, 
Uh, they're scattered around the old Squim Prairie. There's not much, there's really hardly anything in Squim Prairie left, but the oaks, they're still around up there. Um, Oak Bay, uh, which is right between uh, Marrowstone Island and Indian Island, uh, has some oaks up there from the North Sound. Um, there are oaks in Oak Harbor on Whidbey Island, oaks in Pioneer Park and Squim. Um, of course, if you're up on Vancouver Island, you've got uh, all around Victoria, there's a magnificent park in Victoria that's got some natural areas in it that have oak growing in it. Uh, so uh, yeah, and of course the Willamette Valley, uh, Finley National Wildlife Refuge that I showed a few pictures from. Uh, there, and, and then the Columbia Gorge, um, as you start getting a little bit farther uh, east in the gorge, there's lots of oaks in there. And so, yeah, they're, they're actually around a lot of places. Uh, so, yeah, those are a few examples. And what is the best way to determine the age of an oak? Well, um, you got to count the rings, <laughs> okay? And it's difficult. Um, if you can't find a stump where one was cut down, well, you're going to have to get an increment bore and drill into the oak. And I'm going to tell you, they are hard to drill into. This is some hard wood. Um, you extract out from that increment core a little pencil sized piece of wood, and then you can count the rings. Uh, but um, it's tough. I have broken two increment bores in oaks and had to come back with vice grips later and wrestle that uh, that jagged edge, that jagged bore out of it. Uh, so um, yeah, it can also be expensive. We see a lot of jumping gall wasp in our urban Gary Oaks. His low intensity fire prescribed burning a treatment that would minimize jumping gall wasp. What is the alternative to burning in urban settings for controlling the wasp? Or are jumping gall wasps even a problem that needs addressing? Okay, well, here's another one. I actually had a slide in there that talked about the uh, galls, but I had to take it out because there wasn't time. Um, but um, no, the, the, the galls are not a problem. In fact, there isn't any, um, um, but other than the, uh, the uh, acorn uh, predators, there's, there's not really an insect that does a lot of damage to oaks. Uh, the Western oak looper would be maybe the closest because it can defoliate oaks. But remember oaks um, can come back from defoliation very nicely. So even those guys aren't a real problem. No, the galls are, think of them as just some curious little um, fascinating thing. Uh, they, they, they absolutely don't seem to bother the trees at all. Not the apple galls, not the jumping galls. Uh, none of them really seem to phase the tree. Even when you get down in Oregon, where you get the uh, Pacific mistletoe and you get just abundant big balls of mistletoe growing up in there, which of course is a parasitic plant, that doesn't seem to phase the trees either. And in fact, it simply, they found it simply increases the bird diversity in trees. So there's actually a benefit to it. So I wouldn't worry about any of the galls. Um, just be fascinated by them. They're neat little things. And how different are the herbaceous communities in Gary Oak savannas that occur across the range where they were ferned historically? Um, okay, now if I understand the question, where it is the question, I'm gonna guess here that we're talking about the communities between um, um, oaks that were burned regularly and what you find there now. Um, well, what happens when you stop burning is you actually lose most of the herbaceous component and get a dominance of shrubs. And snowberry would be the main uh, native shrub that's gonna come in. Um, Scotch broom is gonna be the main non-native non shrub that's going to come in. And if succession goes far enough, you'll even stop, start to lose the snowberry and start to get, to get salal. So um, fairly quickly, without the, without the fire, you're gonna start switching over to a shrub understory. And you'll probably also start recruiting more trees, get more shade, and that's just gonna aggravate that, uh, that whole thing. Uh, so um, um, 
Yeah, I, I hope I've answered that question correctly. Melanie yeah. asks, is there an up-to-date okay. map of Gary Oaks in Kittitas County? I have found the Propertius duskywing, a butterfly species that uses the oak as a host plant in an area that doesn't seem to have the oak. Well, that's an interesting question. And I, I, I don't really know, but, but there is a very active group down in the Columbia Gorge. Um, the Columbia Land Trust was the one that started it and I think is still more or less leading it. And I can't, the, the name of the group is actually escaping me right now. But um, yeah, I would look up those folks because they are a group of, um, of well, experts, land managers, and just generally interested people uh, that um, could probably, would be very interested in what that, in that information that you just conveyed. Uh, but, um, but also it would be a, a good place for you just to, um, to, uh, to meet some folks that have that interest and uh, might be able to answer some of your questions for that area. And I think they are undertaking a mapping um, exercise as well, as I seem to recall them uh, saying that. So whether or not there is a map um, or whether or not um, that's still forthcoming, I, I, I don't know. Now that's Kittitas County, but anyway, yeah, no, I, I think maybe not Kittitas County, but, um, um, so anyway, that's, yeah, that's the best I can do for you. Okay, I think yeah. this is the last question. Do Gary Oaks preserve fire scars to help reconstruct their community fire history? Uh, yes, they do. Um, there, I guess there's a uh, caveat here. Uh, I have seen fairly frequently when a, an oak tree is scarred um, that of course you get rot into the tree fairly uh, quickly. Um, sometimes when a fire burns back through that area, it will ignite that rotten punky wood and it will smolder sometimes for days until the tree topples over. So um, you don't necessarily preserve all those scars, uh, but um, yeah, I have, I have seen oaks with multiple scars on. So um, there is the potential to do fire history studies on, on oak trees. Okay, and I would like to just mention what's in the chat here. We have Prairie Appreciation Day will be May 14th, 2022. Excellent. And you can go to prairieappreciationday.org. You can see that in the chat if you uh, look at it. And then we have many, thank you, Dave. Excellent presentation. I learned a lot from Van. Really fascinating and enjoyable presentation. Thank you for sharing this knowledge from Stefan. And many uh, compliments like that. Um, we're reminded you can get a pass to get on JBLM property. Let's see. Thank you, enjoyed access to your wealth of knowledge. I agree. Uh, let's see. Many thank yous. Oh, and Denise is reminding us, please join us on Thursday night for a very special interview with Jerry Franklin Register here. And that's in our chat at about 8.32 p.m. tonight. And you can just go to the website to register for that as well, wnps.org and look at um, the upcoming programs. Heidi Bohan, very informative. Thank you, Linda Storm. Thank you so much for sharing your deep knowledge, Dave. So many people have said that here. Um, fascinating presentation. And I think you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific <laughs> presentation, great ecological story. So well, well I would like to thank everybody out there um, for listening. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, very gratifying to know that there's actual interest in this. Um, so thank you all. We appreciate your time you spent here and you took so many questions above and beyond. So thank you again. And um, you've added a lot to our Native Plant Appreciation Month by giving this program. So we will say good night. <laughs>